And a very warm welcome from me to the Q4 quarterly investment briefing. Um, and uh, really pleased to have so many of you here today to join with us in this final session of the year, um, which is intended to bring everyone together for a conversation really about what the year's been like from an investment perspective. Um, so we'll start with a few logistics uh, announcements as far as you need them when you're working from home. So hopefully you've got your refreshments covered. You should have your, your lunch and your uh, cup of tea in front of you, perhaps. Um, and I'm sure you know all about uh, where the toilets and the fire exits are. And if you don't, I definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, but the thing I can be helpful about is Twitter. So we're going to be um, sending out the odd tweet on our hashtag QI briefing. Um, so if you'd like to join us in doing that, then please do. Also, uh, practically, if you're looking at the screen and you want the slides to be a little larger, there's a couple of things you can do to make that happen. So the first one is that you can double click on the slides and they will be um, larger rather than our faces. Um, and then the second thing you can do, there's a tiny arrow with a line next to it at the top of the screen um, on the right hand side, but slightly towards the middle. If you click that, the chat will be collapsed. Um, and so as that's slightly smaller, the slides will get slightly larger as well. So a couple of things you can do there to, to access the content a little more easily. Um, and uh, the other, the final logistical announcement, and it's really one that's a great joy to be able to share, um, is to thank our fantastic partners who you'll see on the bottom of that slide there, who've been able to help us make these events happen over the last 12 months uh, and help us make the, the seamless switch to this online world. Um, and, and also we'll be continuing their support um, for the Investment Activator Programme next year as well. So uh, we're hugely grateful to those organisations listed at the bottom of the screen there um, who've enabled us to make this happen. Um, and do get in touch with us if you'd like to connect with any of them um, or if you don't already. So I always start these events. They've been running now for coming up for three years. And I always start with a reminder of what the point of the quarterly investment briefing is. Um, and the intention was always to bring investors and enablers of investment together to network, share and learn. Um, so we recognize that there were a huge number of events for founders to pitch at, uh, even across the southwest where we are, based in Bristol and Bath, um, but that there wasn't a huge amount of events for investors to actually network together, um, perhaps in their own circles, but perhaps not uh, finding out some of the kind of broader news about the investment ecosystem more widely. So that's what we're trying to bring you here today in these events. Uh, we run them once a quarter and we'll be continuing to do that next year. We also make sure that everything that's going to be presented as far as possible is informative, fact based and regionally relevant. So I've asked all of our speakers today to make sure um, that they're bringing you news that is relevant to our region and that will help you and your work as an investor or an enabler of investment. And I should say by enabler, I really mean those lawyers and accountants who make the deals happen and um, the people who are really keeping that investment ecosystem vibrant and, and moving. And then the final thing, the final principle there is uh, very much that we value the, the opportunity to learn equally with the opportunity to share. Um, so you might have thought when you signed up to this event, gosh, two hours, Bryony, what were you thinking? Well, uh, the first hour will be content. The second hour is, in fact, networking time for you to connect with other people on this call. So um, don't feel that you need to stick around. But the whole point, really, of these events is to make sure that we're beginning a conversation about investment and making sure that we're improving our region and making sure it's one of the best places to, to start and to grow a business. So um, stick around for the networking at the end. As far as the agenda is concerned, I'm going to do a short bit of uh, welcome and scene setting now, and then we're straight into our lightning talks. Um, so I'm really pleased to welcome Rod Beer from the UK BAA, Henry Hallwood from Bohurst, and Jerry Barnes from BPEC, and Jake Roney from Newable um, to the session today. They've got various different topics they're going to be covering, but all related to that annual review of 2020 in some way or another. Um, after the lightning talks, then there will be a chance for questions during those talks. So if you have got a question for the speakers that pops into your mind, um, please do share it in the chat bar um, on the right hand side and I'll make sure uh, to keep an eye on that. And we'd love to make sure the conversation is flowing. So do let us know if you've got any questions. And then, as I say, after the lightning talks, we will get into a bit of data, which has been kindly provided by our connection and our data partner with Bohurst. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about what's going on as far as investment in the last quarter and talk about who's raising in the next quarter. So I've got 12 companies, maybe 13, um, who are raising investment at the moment, ranging from uh, a couple of million down to about 250,000 is perhaps the lowest amount this time. Um, so I'll share some information about that, too. 
Um, but I wanted to start it with a headline for this quarter, uh, and we've actually seen 12 companies raise investment in the west of England uh, over the last quarter. So that's since the last event, which was the 17th of September. Um, and by west of England, I mean Bristol, Bath, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. I know there's different definitions that do the rounds, but um, that's the area that we particularly focus on. Um, my plan is next, uh, next, as from January, to start focusing on the wider southwest. And we do welcome pitches actually from companies in Wales as well. So um, we're gradually expanding our reach. Um, but as far as this statistic is concerned, our 12 companies have raised just over 18 million in the last quarter, um, which is great news. Uh, but who are they, you might ask? Well, um, here's a quick summary of those companies that have raised in the last quarter. Um, you probably read the news about Habu in one of my monthly investment updates. Um, they raised £14 million as part of their Series A, um, which is really significant and helps them to uh, build out that uh, service, which is hugely in demand at the moment in terms of fulfilment for e-commerce businesses. Um, we also saw the Wave make a significant uh, investment this year or receive a significant investment rather in this last quarter. Cerex Medical and then Create Health, who I'll put the spotlight on as well um, and celebrate them because they're actually the fourth investment um, from the Creative Growth uh, Finance Debt Fund, which was set up by Creative England and Triodos just last year. So um, great to see that that's actively making investments. A few other companies there who've made some smaller investments, um, uh, received some smaller investments rather, uh, not least Yamello, who um, managed a crowdfunding round of £100,000 as well. So um, some great news in the last quarter. But this event is all about the last year. So I thought I would just crunch the numbers in terms of investment and give us a little bit of context for the uh, talks that we're going to hear in just a moment. Um, so in 2020, so far, we've seen 86 companies uh, raise a little over 184 million between them. Um, and that uh, includes a really significant slug from Graphcore at 116 million, the, the Habu raise, which I've just mentioned, um, and also Hyeta Technologies, uh, who raised 11 million. Um, but how does that compare with last year, you might ask? Well, in 2019, we saw 136 companies raise uh, significantly more. I mean, I go as far as nearly double. Um, so we saw them raise 349 million, as you can see there on the slide, um, including a really very significant um, funding round for Ovo Energy, who received 200 million, and that um, elevated their status as one of Bristol's two unicorns. We have also saw some really good rounds for Immersive Labs and for Exmos and for a number of others um, who obviously added up to that 349 million, which made me think, if you're anything like me and a bit of a data nerd, well, was that an anomaly? Which one of these is actually the trend? Um, well, I just thought I'd dig out one more year. Um, I haven't got it on a slide, but in 2018, we had 129 companies, so nearly the same number as 2019, um, who raised 255 million between them. Again, um, a big chunk of that went to Graphcore um, and uh, to Bright Pearl and the Molson Group and also to Immersive. So um, Immersive Labs, that is. So some interesting data there, which gives you a bit of a sense of the, the volume of deal flow that's going through the region um, and the, the volume of investments that are happening. But on that note, uh, as I said, I'm glad, very glad to welcome a couple of experts to talk to us about what's been going on this year. That's just my um, crude data cut um, to give a bit of context. But uh, Rod, I'm really pleased you're able to join us today, not least because um, you're a long standing friend of the region and uh, helped me to set up the Angel Hub and Engine Shed uh, two or three years ago now, which was um, fantastic. Um, but also that uh, you are, of course, um, continuing that involvement and running all sorts of angel training and uh, stuff that's helping us to improve our angel community locally. So um, I shall stop sharing my slides and hopefully yours will appear um, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Barney. Can you see my slides okay? I can only see my slides, so I can't see the rest of the hop in. Oh, marvellous. That has happened. Excellent. Yes, Great. I can see your slides. Thank Great. you. Hello, thank you for having me. And yeah, we've been, you know, really supportive of all the work that you've been doing as well down in the south, across the west of England and the southwest as well, deeper too. So that has been great working with you. Um, just a quick introduction to UK Business Angel Association and to me, I'm, I'm Rod Beer, I'm the Managing Director at the UK BAA, which is the UK Business Angel Association. 
in a nutshell, with a trade body for angel and early stage investing. And it's our job to help support and build and grow and connect and educate and train all those that deploy capital at early stages. So I think collectively we look after about 200 companies and lots and lots and lots of individuals as well who are who all told invest just over two billion pounds every year into UK based businesses across the full spectrum. So we have some pretty big VC as members as well, um, which is great. What I've been asked to do is talk a little bit about some of the impact on, on um, that COVID has had on the investment ecosystem. We're probably going to get some really interesting stats based um, um, insights from Henry after me as well. So he's probably got some really good insights too as well. But I wanted to share it from a, from the angel perspective on the back of some research that we've been doing quite recently. Uh, let me just switch over. So we did, uh, we recently conducted the UK Business Angel Market 2020 report in uh, collaboration with the British Business Bank. And it was, we do this every year or two. It's quite a big, a big undertaking trying to get angels. And I think a lot of Bristol angels, um, took part as well which has been great to see um and lots of support from bpec and other groups in the area too um where we're trying to really get an understanding of what the uh what's happening out across the ecosystem um, from an angel perspective we also did a kind of an update a covid a kind of covid update as well to really try and uh, try to understand what, what 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 is the outlook and what is happening on the ground there from an angel view and there's a few things that, you know, it's, I wanted to kind of just chat you through some of the stats that we've seen. That report is open, live and available from on our website, ukbaa.org.uk. Uh, there's a couple of things that have broken it down to the good, the bad, the ugly. In fact, in reality, it's all actually pretty ugly, but I thought I'd put a bit of a nice face in it seeing as we're going into Christmas. The good is that there are some positives from COVID-19. 48% of angels um, thought that their, you know, the sectors that they're particularly investing in have actually benefited from COVID-19. So there are some opportunities there. And I'm going to share some stats around some of the sectors that have done particularly well through COVID-19 from an investment perspective. However, that's of the of all the survey respondents, only 25 members thought there was a positive impact from COVID-19. So actually the, the the real the real aspect is it's the bad is the fact that generally speaking, COVID has had a negative impact on their ability to invest. And that is uh, a, a major issue and 55% of the time it's because of this economic uncertainty attached to the investor's own kind of personal investment capacity you know if there's t if there's prices are going up if there's you know um a lot of fluctuations in markets etc and maybe pension funds aren't doing so well then perhaps they're, they're less likely to deploy as much capital in fact 55% of investors have said you know it's been it's been linked to that um the other reason was it was having a negative impact on investors' ability to invest or want to invest during COVID-19 and a little bit beyond is the fact that they're now concentrating and supporting and investing in their own portfolio businesses. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we've seen a significant shift of, although kind of the angel investing has dr certainly dropped over COVID-19, it's not been as bad as I, I expected. But what has happened is there's been a big, big shift from investors investing into new businesses, new deals with their first rounds, to actually just reinvesting and propping up existing portfolio companies to give them more runway to see them through, you know, these uh, tempestuous times. Um, so that's been a bit of a, a bit of a, 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 a bit of an ongoing theme. So it's going to be a, there is, I think, and will continue to be so into 2021, a significant reduction in access to capital for first time fundraisers. So that kind of that post friends and family funding rounds could be challenging, which will have a knock on effect in two or three years time. That's less great businesses for our Series A, Series B, VC counterparts. Um, so we are actively working across public um, and private to see what we can do to help support and prop up some of this this, this supersede investment uh, capacity. Uh, the ugly is really the, 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 some of the sector performances that we've seen. Um, leisure, hospitality and tourism has, as you can expect. So so the dark blue means it's been worse. Uh, the angels felt that it's been significantly worse. Their portfolio performance of companies within these sectors has been significantly worse because of COVID. Light blue means it's been better. Tourism, leisure, film, theatre, entertainment, property and construction, fashion and design, advertising and publishing have all kind of, you know, really had a bit of a crash uh, whereby on the flip side of the bottom of the chart, those who are actually looking pretty strong from, from COVID, so better than pre-COVID-19, biotech, gaming, healthcare, uh, security and cyber security, digital media, content, etc. Things you would expect, e-commerce, you, you, you'd expect it really. Um, I guess some aspects, some good, strong, you know, you've got quite a strong biotech life sciences ecosystem down in, in Bristol, good, strong gaming ecosystem and healthcare um, as well, uh, electronics and hardware, you've got some really good stuff coming out there. So there's so it's not all bad, to be honest, but I think there are certainly some some big um, 
some big issues for some sectors out there from an angel investing, but also a, a portfolio performance perspective. And that has driven a location, um, I guess, I think the Southwest you'll see are at the very top of the chart here. And this is, you know, from an investor's perspective, how well are their portfolio companies performing uh, broken down by region? So the Southwest, which of course, Bristol, et cetera, the West of England is always in the Southwest lumped with a lot of the stats that we do, um, is probably having one of the biggest, the, the worst uh, kind of COVID-19 impact. Um, and I think this isn't the most accurate or most amazing of data. So there are some a pinch of salt. Sample sizes weren't massive as well. You can see only 35 respondents, 22 respondents, you know, 120 people responding in Greater London, but it is indicative. And I think it might be because we know the wider Southwest has a has a very strong, well, pre, you know, traditionally very strong uh, tourism and kind of hospitality sector. It's quite, it's quite a strong part of that um, of that ecosystem. So seeing that that's been dropped and so significantly impacted, will probably have a bit of a a bit of a, a magnifying dent on the region as a whole. And in fact, some of the stats that that Brian you've shown about the investment coming in has been has been significantly reduced. Um, but we are still hopeful. Investors have been you know, keeping their powder dry, ready to just carry on investing. I think something like 40% of investors, although half of them have said they are negatively impacted by COVID-19 from an investment perspective, there is actually half who'd say, look, it, it's, I'm still going to be investing. I'm still putting money into new businesses. Maybe not quite as many, but it's still going to happen. So the wheels haven't fallen off. Uh, it's just that the engine is grinding a little bit, maybe at a lower gear than it probably should be. Returns did very well. So I wanted to kind of talk about still about this is a bit more from our from our we've had some exciting Monte Carlo simulation work done on the uh, return performance. So this is the we've asked all the angels last year, good 300 of them, what's been your exit for, for exit multiples from investments uh, that realized in 2018, 2019 year. So not the 2021, which is the, the terrible, awful year we all want to forget, but the 2018, 19 year. Uh, and in fact, it's been pretty strong. Um, some really good um, portfolio performance. And in fact, our friends at uh, invest found a catalyst have run using the kind of returns and exit um, data extrapolated from our report run a Monte Carlo simulation to really understand what is the average rate of return on investing in early stage and also what is the kind of optimum portfolio size and here is the answer which is quite interesting it is obviously a Monte Carlo simulation it's based on the data from our research report but actually it stacks up pretty strongly with stats in the US the stats we've been tracking on uh, for, for many years as well so the answer is really with the optimum number of companies you should have in your portfolio from an angel investment perspective from 2018 2019 perspective is is about 17 it, it, 25 is really good but the bare minimum of 10 to be honest and for a 10 grand investment you get your 26,000 pounds uh, return so a 2.6x return is what we're achieving across the board which is really interesting so i just wanted to share the kind of the exciting you might have seen some of these simulations happening in in the states of their data we've now got one in the uk which is nice and it highlights a lot of the things that we've been saying around bare minimum of 10 15 companies in your portfolio but 25 to be comfortable to really hit those average returns of a kind of a 2.6 2.7x over a long period of time so 10 years etc uh, it's not an overnight thing um which is fun. Uh, that's now kind of, I guess, my quick uh, romp through some of the stats and data that we've seen uh, recently. I also just wanted to quickly shout out about the angelaccelerator.org.uk. Do feel free to check it out. It's where if you're an investor or you're new to investing, if you're based in the southwest, west of England, you can access free e-learning, lots of support and guidance, etc. cetera. Um, if you're only if you're based in that region as part of the Innovate UK Regional Angel Investment Accelerator Program. So have a look at angelaccelerator.org.uk. Sign up. It's all free and it's all lots of fun and very helpful. That's it from me. Does anyone have any questions? You're muted, Bryony, I think. Or oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> yeah, really no, I'm coming. I have my mouse on my other screen. It's always the way, isn't it? Um, but hey ho, fabulous. Thank you, Rod. That was fascinating. Um, some really good stuff in there and great to have that Monte Carlo simulation to evidence that um, statistic that I've heard you say many times before, which is not have the intelligence of doing that myself. Someone else did it and it looked quite interesting. So I thought it, <laughs> it is all very exciting. Uh, it's hot off the press as well. Yeah, great. Fab. Um, so I had a couple of questions for you. Um, one is actually on the back of the session which you kindly invited me to last week, which was the part of the Future Forward sessions that you've been running for a few days. Mm -hmm. I remember the last session, so of three days. So I don't know how much of it you recall. Um, but there were some really interesting um, comments about the various angel groups around the country 
And I particularly picked up on the, the kind of proactive role that the Scottish and Welsh government have played in terms of um, paying for the due diligence or seed funding angel groups or I you know, trying to pick up the nuances of exactly what that looks like um, and found myself wondering two things. One is how do we do that on a regional basis, given that the UK government is very unlikely, or English government rather, is very unlikely to step up and do the same. Um, but the second is, how can we um, make something like that happen? Is that the only way to catalyse angel activity or are there other things we should be doing? Yeah, no, really good point. I think there's a couple of things. So we used they, that used to happen. The RDAs, the Regional Development Agencies, which is something that happened and knocked around many, many moons ago, used to fund uh, angel groups and um, to help support them and grow them. Um, that RDA funding fell away and the angel group d just just imploded. And, and then suddenly there was no, a complete void of angel activity within the respective regions because they were reliant on that public mm -hmm. funding. Um, there is a lot to learn from Scotland. So for those of you less familiar, Scotland, uh, Scottish Investment Bank and Scottish Enterprise, they have, they've been doing for many years now, they, they have a co-fund where they actually religiously invest alongside the angel groups, but also provide a little bit of admin and seed funding to help actually the, the management and growth of those groups. So they've now got 18 very strong angel groups up in Scotland. And it is actually a model that we, that, that, that we say that that's a really good, a really good model. It's something that we've been trying to get more public support and funding, um, here, what we think is there should be public support and funding and propping up of private investment and private decision making. So we've been supportive of things like the VIA program, which is putting grants alongside angels, which is what we, which is what is up here on the screen. Also, the regional angel program, which is the BBBs. It's been a bit of a hard work that one, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a hundred million pound fund put aside to go in and to be and to be um, handled by angel groups. And we're going to hear from someone in the local region who might be speaking about something like that potentially have, have happened. I don't want to steal any thunder um, where they can access and deploy alongside the angels. We've also got the Angel Co Fund. We've also got Midlands Engine Investment Fund, Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund, Cornwall, Ireland, Silly Fund, who invest alongside in and alongside angels too. So having that co-funding is really key. We want to see a bit of seed funding and support to help get groups and maintain and manage groups. I think that could be really helpful or certainly some, some helpful resources there. Um, but, you know, if, for instance, that Scottish funding was to be pulled or reduced, that whole market could implode. So actually, the benefit of not having this publicly funded angel ecosystem means that we have a very resilient ecosystem that can survive and grow. And we have 84 angel group members as part of UK BAA investing over, over 250 million every year. So um, there are some good sides to it too. Yeah, wow, great. Interesting. Um, no Southwest Fund. I, I always love that list of the Northern Powerhouse and the Cornwall and Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> One day we'll keep campaigning. Yeah, um, maybe the Western Gateway will, will help us out, which is the yeah. latest construct to try and attract some attention to this part of the um, part of country. Um, my other question is very selfish. Um, so you'll know, probably having heard me speak at various events, that my favourite fun fact related to angel investing came from your survey a few years ago, which was um, that the Southwest is third in line after London and the Southeast in terms of volume of angel investors or ultra high net worth individuals. But that 85 percent of their investment goes into the Golden Triangle. Um, and that has been one of the kind of key motivators for a lot of the work that I've been doing is to try and say, look, there's loads of deal flow here and lots of interesting things happening. Um, how can we better connect those investors to the deal flow that's happening locally, whether it's through angel groups or other activities? Um, so I guess I've got a two pronged question. One is, is there an update on that data? And am I still reflecting the truth or has it changed entirely um and, and then the second part of that question really is um yeah what would you be saying that we should be doing in the next few years to to resolve this challenge yeah okay yeah, good question so i think um a couple of things so um specifically knowing where they're based and then where they're investing there is no update to that data we know anecdote we know that they're deploying 65 70 percent of the investments going into london the southeast but we also know that Southwest has actually a really, you know, quite a strong investor population down there as well. I can probably on the take check out the latest report. It will have the latest, the latest uh, results as to where they are based. In fact, I've got it in front of me now. Let me just see with the Southwest has moved on geographical spreads. Greater London is first, as you can imagine. Southeast is second, and coming in third is the Southwest. So you're still third place, third spot, which is pretty good going. Um, so you haven't been budged at all. I think people are still investing in, because I think 
I think a lot of people with wealth in the Southwest often do there's a lot of work happening in London. You stay, you know, you have your, your, your finish, you're working up there. You then your pitch events are always in the evening up in London, showcasing London based businesses. So having more local activities, I think, is a really good thing. And I really support that. So what can we do to help? I think there will be a bit more of a shift looking away from London. We've got really we've got a reduction in angel investment capacity potentially over the next year. People are going to be kind of holding back a little bit more, propping up portfolios, et cetera. So we've got a slight reduction there. Um, which will mean that from an investor's perspective, I'm going to want my money to go further and to get me probably a bit more of a shareholding than I would traditionally in the very frothy valuations in London. So I'm hoping that some of that will drive a bit more of like, well, we, we should be looking further afield. We're also coupled with the fact that now without any physical meeting happening whatsoever, the geographical barriers are, are, are pretty much removed. A lot of people have been saying we're now on a on a level playing field with everyone across Silicon Valley, across everyone, because we're all just online. All we can see is the backdrop, and that's about it. We're not we're not confined to geography. Um, so I think I think we will see a bit of an improvement and a shift. And there is the government's obviously keen to continue working on that leveling up agenda. We still are massively keen on supporting that too. So there will be a shift, but it is a long term game um, and i think the work that you do brian it will help certainly help towards some of that great thank you yeah no that's really interesting to hear um and and terrific that we're we are starting to see that we have done for the last kind of 12 months or so from a vc perspective particularly um so we've seen more and more of them be a bit more creative about how they engage with companies locally whether it's sending a team member down and um, putting them in a nice flat on White Ladies Road for three months or um, whether it's bringing the whole team down to the Sparkies, which is our big tech celebration. So um, there's some creative stuff going on. And I, I echo your thoughts that hopefully that will continue and, and more so happen in the angel world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you ever so much. Um, I, I'm keeping one eye on the clock, so um, I'll thank you gratefully for uh, your contributions today. Really great to see you, Rod, and thanks so much for sharing the insights that you have. Um, we'll yeah, see you. Are you going to stick around for networking? Uh, I, I can't. I've got another meeting in about half an hour's time, but I'm going to stay for as much of this content as I can because it's exciting. Marvelous. Super. Serves me right for having a long event. Yeah, <laughs> great thanks. stuff. Thanks so much. See thanks, you soon. Brian. Super. Um, so I'm going to move us seamlessly on to our second speaker today, um, who's Henry Horwood, and another long-standing friend of the region in terms of somebody who's helped me out a lot um, in making sure that I can bring some really great data to you all around investment. So Henry is the head of research and consultancy at Bohurst, who are our data partner for these events and for the wider Investment Activator program. Um, and I've asked him to uh, share some insights from the Bohurst data, particularly thinking about the kind of founder perspective, but obviously focused around this issue of uh, access to investment that we've been talking about today over the last year or so. Um, and I know that we can't talk about that topic without talking about COVID. So it will be great to get some insights on that too. Um, so over to you, Henry. Uh, thanks, Bryony. Um, and I think I'm like uh, Chris Whitty and, and the, the rest of them. I get to ask you to, to load up the, the next slide um, whenever I need it. Um, I'll, I'll start um, just by introducing Bohurst a little bit. I'm aware that a, a lot of people on this already already know who we are, but for those of you who don't, uh, we're an online platform tracking the UK's ambitious private companies. So, um, Brian, if you'd give me my next slide, I can say a little bit about what that um, what that means. Um, so, we track uh, any company meeting one or more of these triggers. So, if you started a business. Today, and you raised 10K from your friends and family, we'd start tracking you. If you were an academic at a university and you span out, we'd start tracking you. If you attended an accelerator or received a grant from Innovate UK, we'd start tracking you. Um, and since 2011, when we started, we're close to tracking um, almost 40,000 companies. Um, nearly half of those use equity investment. We, and as I, as I mentioned, we will we'll track you if you do a friends and family round. <laughs> and we'll track you all the way through to um, you know, the multi-hundred million dollar rounds that we're starting to see more and more of. Um, so it's that equity investment uh, trigger that I'm going to speak to today in particular. Um, and I'll try try and explain a little bit about what's happened um, dur during coronavirus uh, as, as best I can. Um, thanks, Brian. Next slide. Um, so... In order to try and uh, quantify the impact of um, coronavirus, or rather perhaps the, the impact of uh, the lockdown measures imposed in response to coronavirus, um, we've been looking at the investment volumes um, since the 23rd of March and comparing that with the same calendar period 
um, the year before. So 23rd of March up to the 1st of December here, looking at that calendar period, 2019, 2020. And you can see here, in terms of the amount, uh, it is down uh, by 17%. Uh, in terms of the number of deals, it's down by 13%. Now, um, this is only capturing straight uh, equity deals. Um, this doesn't include um, convertible note activity, which means it therefore doesn't include uh, the future funds activity. Um, once you start to factor in the activity of the future fund, both money coming from the government itself and uh, the net, the required co-investment in those rounds, these numbers start to look relatively positive, um, you know, not not dissimilar overall to, to 2019. And given that you know, there's there's a month left, December isn't always uh, the busiest month for deal making, but but stuff does happen, especially uh, in, in the run up to Christmas. Some people don't want it bleeding over into um, 2021. Well. People didn't want it bleeding over into the next year, last year. What people think uh, this December um, is, is anyone's guess. It is, it is all change. Uh, but overall, you know, the, the picture looks pretty good. And um, in terms of later stage investment, larger deals, uh, everything looks relatively positive. You'll, you'll hear plenty of talk about how much dry powder there is out there. Um, and I'm oh, sorry, we we'd, we'd <laughs> darted around a bit on the slides there. Um, and uh, so there's pl plenty of dry capital out there. If you are raising larger rounds, um, they are they are still still happening. The area where there's a bit of a problem, you can well, you can start to see there's a bit of a problem is in first time raises. So if I have my next slide, um, please, Brian. Um, luckily, this um, I'm very pleased whenever I'm presenting alongside someone else who's also um, presenting research, like Rod just was. Uh, I'm pleased to be saying the same thing rather than uh, uh, contradicting someone. And we can see there's, there's, this is where the issue is most concentrated in first, um, first time raises. So the amount raised is down by 52%. That one could be less, less important of a signal because if you're raising money at the moment, your capital requirements have completely changed. Um, you probably, you used to sort of raise and then immediately get a nice shiny office to, to bring your team together, um, for, for the first time, that kind of thing. Obviously, uh, well, some people are still doing that, uh, but lots of people are, are reconsidering what they need in terms of, of office space. So that could be affecting how much people need to raise. It's also worth saying that sort of over time, um, you know, since since 2011, we've started seeing the the costs of starting a business go down as well. To take one example, if you are a tech or software business like we are, when, when we started, um, you know, we had to install server racks and things like that, whereas now you can spin up a lot of things on Amazon Web Services or, or similar, which gives you a greater degree of flexibility in your initial spend, um, at least. Amazon are quite good at, at extracting value from you as you get larger, but um, at least at the starting point, it's um, a bit more flexible. So the, the number that really concerns us is this 30%. And there's no sort of add-on here from, from the future fund because um, necessarily these companies are ex excluded from uh, the future fund. A requirement of the future fund is that you have raised 250,000 pounds previously. Um, these, these companies aren't in that position that they're looking to raise their first 250,000 um, pounds. So there's no, there's no sort of extra deals um, happening there. Given everything that's happened, ultimately 30% still, still isn't too bad. It, it could be a lot worse. When we looked at the numbers in April, it was a lot worse. Um, so there's you know, some reasons for cautious optimism on, on that front, but I think as, as Rod alluded to as well, the, the problem will be going into 2021, the people, which is you know, a lot of the angels on, on this call, um, who are going to rectify this problem are also going to find, find themselves under a lot of pressure in 2021, the, the need to support your existing portfolio isn't going to go away even if we come herring out of the gates in January, which fingers crossed we will, there's still gonna be a lot of time to repair and undo, um, maybe not the damage, but the, the consequences of what's happened um, in uh, 2020. I'm sure loads of your companies have you know, taken on lots of debt um, that will affect um, what, what they need to do in terms of raising. And all of that sort of stuff is going to continue to apply um, pressure, downward pressure on, on this area of the market in 2021. Um, 
I guess, yeah, overall, that is a bit pessimistic. I was trying trying to tell myself before this call to try and stay stay a bit optimistic, but it is it is a little bit pessimistic. And it, this will just trickle down to become a problem for later stage VCs and, and ultimately um, the economy if we if we continue continue to see these these low levels of, of new startups. Uh, next slide. Hopefully, I can can I say something more positive? Yeah. Okay. It's top top sectors. It's the I could have you can flip this on its head, and I could have been negative and, and identified the bottom sectors. Um, some of these will come as uh, no surprise, um, especially to Rod. I think I did present this slide um, at his at his talk last week as well. Um, so fintech continues to to be the powerhouse that, that drives investment activity, um, as does AI. Cybersecurity creeping up in in recent years there. Um, and just to say that sort of methodologically, these can overlap. Um, so we classify deals uh, into as many of these sectors as, as are relevant. So um, you know, indeed, there will be a num number of fintech and AI companies. And indeed, there'll be some that, that are all of those top three there. The new entrants to this list in particular are eHealth and EdTech. So towards the start of the pandemic, um, we ran an exercise to look at the uh, impact of coronavirus on, on each business's business model. So our analysts went and looked at all of those 40,000 companies, looked at what they were saying on their social media about what had happened and what you can infer from, from their business model. You know, if you have got physical premises, they were closed, etc. One of the sectors that was... Um, so the digital security, e-health and edtech were all the top sectors um, in terms of the See the sort of proportions of companies that were seeing a positive impact. So they basically increase in demand and an increase in demand that they were able to meet. Um, that has now started, as you, as you can see here in this chart, um, translate into deals. Um, so the, these companies, uh, the, the companies that were faring well have also now subsequently received um, for further investment. Um, so it's nice to see that, that sort of crystallizing um, for investors as well as the, the companies themselves. Okay, the next slide, please, Brian. Um, so looking at the, the top top locations, so the, the, this number on the right, sorry, I should have explained, is, is the number of deals happening previously in the sectors and now happening in the, these locations. Um, I've excluded London, uh, because if you include London, all you get is a list of uh, London boroughs. Um, looking outside of London, I see quite a strong lead um, for, for Edinburgh. Uh, there are a few factors um, to that. Uh, again, Rod, Rod mentioned the uh, activity of um, the Scottish government um, in investing in pretty much everything they see. Uh, so being, being a very reliable um, co-investor in that regard. Um, that will also be part of why Cardiff is on the list. Um, the Development Bank of Wales operates qu quite a similar policy and similar funds. Um, and I, I included this slide um, for you as much as anything because to show that Br Bristol is is on this uh, list as well as one of the, the top locations um, outside of London. And indeed, actually, if you were to exclude um, the, the sort of golden triangle, and you start to see Bristol um, pretty much uh, near, near the top of the list there. Uh, next slide, if possible, please. Um, so just to bring it bring it home uh, a bit more, rather than talking sort of generally about about the UK, about what's going on in the southwest. Um, interesting to see here that you know, some of the top sectors are unsurprising, but there's um, you know, AI moves to the top compared to where it was fintech for for the UK generally. Cyber again higher higher than fintech here as well, uh, and then quite pleasing to see e-health and, and blockchain um, performing well in the, the southwest as well as. Um, Robotics, which is um, quite, quite an interesting one to see, see so near the, the top of the list. Um, and I think that's probably um, my slides. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, any questions, I guess? Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Well, I will um, extend that invitation to the audience to ask Henry any questions uh, related to that great data. Really interesting to see um, how the, the kind of macro trends are reflected in the Southwest as well, as you say, in a slightly different order. I find myself um, reaching to some interesting observations about what kind of um, uh, kind of assets or uh, nodes exist to support those different sectors. So we have um, the Academic Health Science Network, for example, who are really proactive in the region, um, operating out of UWE. 
uh, and they do a lot around e-health. So, you know, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, and then, of course, we have the Bristol Robotics Lab, um, who are also very active. So, um, yeah, interesting to see how much the data is driven by those specific um, organisations or whether it is, in fact, uh, a broader broader trend. So I'll, I'll definitely be digging into that. Thank you. Um, I was also interested just to pick up on the work you've been doing around the, the scale up index. It won't surprise you to hear because um, as host, you get to ask the, the selfish questions that interest you the most. Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so really great to see the, the kind of scale up news hitting the headlines uh, as part of the scale up institutes uh, announcement and their annual review, which happened a couple of weeks ago three weeks ago i suppose now um and the scale up index i just wondered if there was anything related to that which um would be of particular relevance to this audience that you know the kind of key headlines you might expect them to take away from it yeah i guess uh i think that's also how how we first met was um through through your capacity as the the scale up enabler for for this region um that report uh now in its um fourth year again uh, freely available or rather those those two reports um so it's uh a bit of a couple of weeks ago, it was a bit of a scale up um, jamboree. Um, the the scale up institutes review, which is a, um, a really hefty document laying out um, sort of all of the policy that it, that exists around um, scale up. So for for each region, what actual mechanisms there exist for the support of scale ups, as well as um, the sort of more generic um, policy environment for for scale ups. Alongside that, we publish our scale up index, um, both of which are uh, available on the Scale Up Institute's own website, and you can get the index. Um, and indeed, if you're already on our mailing list, you've probably <laughs> seen me um, harassing your inbox already with the with the scale up index. Um, but that that's all, all freely available. The the upshot of it is that that there are more scale ups. Um, however, there's a bit of a lag. Um, in that uh, data, we also published a, a related report for the London Stock Exchange called The Thousand Companies to Inspire Britain. Again, there's still a decent population of companies to inspire Britain. Um, it's still still too early for, for those kinds of businesses to see things um, trickle through in, in a small majority, in a small minority rather, uh, of companies. Um, we've started to see their latest turnover and headcount numbers. It's at the moment quite a mixed bag. Some people are are faring well, some people aren't. But in terms of seeing the coronavirus impact um, on the scale up landscape generally, it's it's sort of too too soon um, to say. I mean, the idea of a scale up um, has built into it resilience. So you you only sort of get the tag after after three years of of sustained growth. Um, I sort of hope that that um, methodological resilience translates into real business resilience for them. Um, but yeah, it will, it will take a bit of time for us to see the, the, the COVID-19 um, impact come through. Mm. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I'm sure the case, unfortunately. But yes, um, fabulous. I'm I'm going to I have many more questions. I was just uh, checking the clock, however. Um, and so um, I will say a huge thank you to you, Henry. And um, as you've got your details there on the slide, so I'm sure if anybody wants to get in touch to find out more, um, they can do that directly if you're happy. Feel free. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you all so much for, for being here and sharing some insights. Really interesting. And uh, I'm sure we will speak again soon. Bye bye. Fab, thank you. Take care. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Jake and Jerry to uh, back onto the stage. Hopefully they will reappear magically. Bear with me. And uh, also, just was a minor lag. Here we are. Here's Jerry. Marvellous. Um, and I'm sure Jake will be here just um, very soon too. So, uh, as I mentioned, the session theme today is all about a kind of review of 2020. Um, and so it's been a massive year um, on many levels, um, both in terms of positive impact, as we've heard, for some of the companies and also a, a really quite significant detrimental impact for others. Um, how much of that is sector specific, as we've seen in the slides, is pretty evident. Um, but uh, one of the big headlines that's just hit the news in the last week or two um, is some great news, which comes from our friends at Bristol Private Equity Club and Newable. So I thought, what better way that, to round off the year than with some positive news? Um, so, Jerry, I will hand over the mic to you to, to give us a bit of an update on all things BPEC to start with. Thank you very much. If you can hear me OK. Um, first of all, um, thanks for, um, for the invitation to, to, to speak. 
Jerry Barnes, yes, founder and um, CEO of, um, of BPEC. Uh, next slide. Um, um, I, I discovered that um, I, I produced this slide um, a year ago to the, the same, uh, uh, same event. And um, I'm pleased to report that um, the slide is now busier than it was um, 12 months ago. <clears throat> Those are, I hope, the uh, entire 23 companies that um, BPEC have invested um, so far to date. And as you can see at the top, um, we've invested a, about £7 million pounds, um, in those companies in the year up to 30th of, of September. Um, it's a very big mix, um, and they range from community-type um, investments, um, this month, um, autonomy, which you could call health tech as well these days, all the way down to, all the way up um, to uh, space, space tech with, um, with SpaceForge and everything else in between. So it's, uh, it, 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 we cover all sectors and, uh, and, 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 and whatever we, um, we, we are invited to look at. Um, last year, which is the focus, um, was um, not good. And um, it completely, everything you've heard so far from UKBAA and also from Bohurst is, is completely replicated by, by us. Um, in the first six months of our year to 31st of March, 2020, no, go, go back. Um, uh, um, they, um, we had our best six months um, ever from, from, from all the four years we've been together. This was immediately followed by our worst six months um, for the six months from 1st of April to the 30th of September, 2020, where our investment activity was uh, at least 75% down. But I suppose um, uh, for the year and as a total, um, we were probably about 50% down and that information would have fed itself through to all the various surveys that you've um, already listed. So um, um, we, we did okay, um, but um, it, it was quite tough going on to all the, the various new ways of um, promoting ourselves and, and investors looking from the private investors point of view, um, April, May, um, we went into sort of mental lockdown as much as, um, as the country did, and people's confidence was, was, was completely knocked. We did spend a lot of that time uh, supporting our investments and, and, and helping them through their struggles. And I, and I am pleased to report that um, that worked. And um, although there are winners and there are losers, um, there are no failures um, to date. So I'm pleased with that. But sorry, Bernie, could you you can turn over now if you wish. Um, but um, bringing it up to date, which is still in the year in question, the, the, the three months to 31st of December, if I can have some artistic license on that period, is probably going to be one of our strongest, month, our strongest periods. Um, we have at least six deals including three follow-ons, which we are, um, so three new deals and three follow-ons, which we are aiming to um, complete and two have already gone through and we're going through the paperwork on the, on the remaining ones. And somewhere just shy of a million pounds um, will be invested in that three months. And this excludes anything to do with um, the BBI fund um, in those numbers. So um, uh, perhaps it's coming back. Um, Bristol is obviously suffering under the now with the tier three, which is um, um, unfortunate, and I'm being polite. Um, um, but uh, you know, hopefully, we'll come out of that quite strong. So, what I would suggest is that the the investment confidence is certainly there, and and why is that? I, I don't have any pure reasons, but my my guess is that um, by clamping clamping down in the early part of the summer and effectively stopping spending, um, and that includes all sorts of things, which I won't list, um, then I, there, there, there is a backlog. Um, and of course, as people have already shown, um, there are winners. There are companies out there that are, are taking advantage of the um, situation and the mentality that tech can help us. Um, and therefore, there's a huge amount of investment and ideas that are perhaps being um, accelerated 
um, to take advantage of what will be the new normal or is the new normal, whatever you want to call it. And, um, and, and that's flowing through to us very, very quickly. Um, I, as I said there, there's uh, we have no failures yet. We, we, we have had some, um, some movement onto um, some Series A's and that. And, and, and I would, uh, and I, it is nice to know, I think you said it, Dan Bernie, that, um, that one or two more VCs seem to be um, wobbling around our, our region um, and certainly are being slightly more active in, 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 my, uh, in, in my experience. And, and, and I would love to see more. And I think we'd all love to see more um, uh, and more of that to come, come through. Um, there has been a quite a lot of pivoting uh, that wonderful word, which I've discovered in the last uh, uh, six months, which is great to see. If you're if you're investing in decent people, good people, good entrepreneurs, then you throw a problem at them, and they will try and work around it. And um, and even though that the hospitality sector, which as you said in the southwest, and the, uh, a lot of the industry in the southwest has been badly affected, um, we've seen some very positive moves by that sector. To work around that problem, and, um, and we, we continue to support our businesses that are in that um, in that problem. And uh, fingers crossed, they will come out of it perhaps a bit bruised, but maybe a little bit better um, experienced for whatever else the world can throw at them in the future. Um, lastly, on that slide, I just want to—I would like to um, try and emphasize to whoever's listening that um, you know, we, we, we've, we've strengthened our membership in the last 12 months, um, and it's still growing. Um, it's very active. We, we get involved. We are um, very experienced as a, as a collective group. Um, but um, with the good news that um, has already been mentioned, um, you know, we, we, we still have capacity to increase on that. So if anybody wishes to, to join us, they're more than welcome to, to apply. Um, Perhaps the next slide, um, Bernie. Now the future, um, highlighted already, and, um, and I don't want to steal um, um, Jake's thunder who's coming on next, but the um, Regional Angel Programme, which is what we've now joined and partnered with Newables on, is um, trying to, uh, or has been, and is trying to rebalance this um, uh, amount of funds that um, naturally flow into London and the southeast and spread it more across the UK. What we hope we've done here is to attract some of that specifically to the southwest. And um, by partnering with um, BPEC, um, there will be an emphasis, um, I, I have to be honest, uh, about Bristol in that, the clues in the name as I tell everybody as, as we go along. But And the aim, the clear aim of, um, of BPEC um, is to keep as much as that 10 million in our region. And that is a co-investment. Uh, we need pipeline, we need businesses, um, um, and we need to, to work alongside, obviously, um, BBI and, 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 and renewables, et cetera. But the, our aim is certainly over the next two or three years is to keep the vast majority of that money and gear it with local funds and local investment into the Bristol market. And, and hopefully counter some of that imbalance, which... Um, has been there for a while. Um, I, I, I don't know if you want me to introduce Jake. Um, Jake will probably introduce himself, but um, I'm, I'm very delighted to be um, working with Jake on this um, and very much um, with, with the rest of the Newable team. And hopefully at some point we'll, we'll get together and, um, and have a glass of wine to celebrate, which we've done none of that so far, sadly. <laughs> Absolutely. That would, that would definitely be a very nice thing. I have one question for you, Jerry, which Ooh, is just... Gosh, you mentioned new members. Um, what should members expect? How, what does um, being a member look like this year? Because I imagine it's rather different to, to what I've known before. Um, well, I said that the, um, the clues are in the name. I mean, one is Bristol, two is club. Um, we, we, we try and share our collective experience across our investments. Now, that stretches right from the beginning with introductions to, 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 to new businesses and through the process of trying to assess as to whether or not they, they, they fit our model, which is a very flexible model, I hasten. Um, but we want those experienced entrepreneurs to not only invest their money, but also to um, help those businesses with the future. So, I mean, I see it. I, I did a Zoom call this morning with a, with a new one. 
um, we see it as a partnership. We see it as a, a way of um, helping them through that process. Um, patient, which is a another misused word, I think, recently, um, we are patient. Um, not intolerable, but we are patient. So we do expect to, to come in. And, and if you saw the deals, you know, 40 odd deals on 20 odd companies, you know, we are in it for more than one go um, um, and, and help them through. So what do they see? They, they, they see that camaraderie, I hope. And they see us pooling that, pooling that experience um, and um, being, dare I say it, nice. Um, you know, we're not um, venture capitalists by definition, but we would you know, like to see the founders and the angels slightly more protected going forward so they don't get squeezed out as the, um, the rounds get bigger. Um, and that's something you know, we hope that the, the BBI fund will help us with as well. Um, but I mean, um, and members can do as much or as little as they wish. We encourage more, but um, uh, if they wish to do less, they can do that too and, and, um, and listen rather than talk. Um, but uh, you know, we have on average, 50% of our membership invest every year. Great, fab, that's really helpful to give people a bit more of a flavour, thank you. Um, and on that note, I will invite Jake. Let me switch the slides over for you, Jake, and um, uh, hopefully, let me just check, there we are, um, to share some some news and to build on what Jerry's just told us. So over to you, Jake. Yeah, thank you, Barney, thank you, Jerry. Um, no, great to be here. And um, what I'll do is I'll, we have got, uh, hopefully, some good news um, to, to kind of change the mood after, after um after the earlier earlier not so good news i think jerry's right hopefully i think things bouncing back quite quickly is what we're going to to see and we're excited i think about being a part of that what i'll do is just very quickly uh, who am i a bit about newable and then we'll talk about what we're launching with uh, with BPIC. Um, so um, very quickly, um, some may know me, um, but um, for those that don't, I um, way back um, set up a, a renewable energy fund for Tesco, um, 100 million pounds fund to invest in energy efficiency and renewable technologies. Um, spent some time then working for Boris Johnson at the GLA um, on energy uh, strategy and energy delivery, energy efficiency. Um, and then started moving more into um, software businesses and and into um, raising finance um, because uh, through that process we've worked with a lot of very early stage businesses and started to see just how hard that was from moving from early stage ideas to big scale rollout. Um, when I uh, moved to Bath about six years ago now from London, what really struck me was how lucky I'd been in London with. I could go to a bar in Shoreditch and find an investor, a co-founder and a CTO pretty much in one evening. Um, so one of the things that I then got involved in was how we and, and, and a lot of the people who have spoken here today have been involved in this. And it's, it's great to be on the same um, same event as some of the people who have really helped to build up some infrastructure in the Southwest to help address this issue of there being difficult access to capital, um, not as much as there might be in other regions um, in terms of infrastructure. And people like BPEC have really uh, led this over the last few years. Um, I got involved in Set Squared, helping them with their scale up investment program, and then with setting up the Regional Angel Investment Accelerator program, both of which were about trying to help early stage companies access finance more e more easily. And then over the last year and a bit, been working with Newable and BPEC on a bid for um, something that's been mentioned a few times now, the Regional Angel Programme set up by British Business Investments. And we're very excited about now working together on this um, and launching a new new fund, um, deploying some of that money into the Southwest. Um, so that took over a year. Um, why Newable? Why BPEC? Well, BPEC obviously they've done a huge amount to uh, to bring in um, angel investment into the region. Um, and Newable, well, you saw early on how um, the Southwest has a particular focus on certain sectors. And and I think what's interesting for me has always been that Newable share this focus. So as a London-based VC and angel group, it might not be always as visible out here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Newable. But the first thing to notice is that the investment philosophy. 
of new but it's very much geared towards early stage um, angel and seed and post seed up to series a investment but also in a lot of technologies that are very familiar to people in the southwest we're we're not as big in some sectors like fintech for instance as as other areas other regions but we are very big on ai internet of things genetic engineering um e-health 3d printing we've got all of these quantum computing and and there's been this very good fit as we've worked together over the last year on on how newable's investment philosophy fits with what we see a lot of in the southwest so if we move on a little bit um into um, the next slide brian um so newable is London-based um, came out of um, uh, uh, originally um, the, what was the GLC and is, is, has, has got a long tradition of angel investing um, in, in London and the southeast, but also invest nationally. And, and this, um, this program is about sort of extending out beyond the, the traditional routes. Um, been investing in EIS companies for over 25 years. Um, you may have heard of London Business Angels, which were bought into Newable a few years ago. Um, so there's an uh, Newable has access to around 500 angel investors and an EIS fund, which it runs alongside that, which collectively gives around five million a year capacity of investment. And there's that. Plus, there's also the other things that Newable gets involved in, which includes things like. Um, grant writing advice, consultancy, even workspace. In fact, there are a couple of sites that Newable has across the country, including in Bristol. So um, what, we, what we've been kind of um, excited about as we brought this together is that as we um, hopefully start to invest alongside BPEC, we'll also be able to bring in this expertise and this additional capital that Newable can, uh, can bring to leverage the uh, not just BPEC has own investments and the BBI's investments, but also this wider pool of pool of capital. So if we move on to the uh, next slide, Brian, uh, thank you. So the big thing that we want to really talk about, and that I think um, Jerry and uh, and, and uh, the Newable team and I have all been almost too exhausted to, to even celebrate so far, um, is that yes, we have now, uh, it's now been announced that um, British business investments has committed 10 million of new funding um, to, to Newable Ventures and Bristol Private Equity Club to co-invest alongside angel investments. Um, so really exciting that that includes um, investing alongside BPEC, um, but we can also bring in Newable's own angel group um, and the Newable EIS fund. So this allows plenty of ways to multiply the early stage investment, the high risk investment that people at BPEC do, um, and to give that extra power, extra um, extra resilience by hopefully filling up the rounds more quickly and also being able to follow on. So the fund can invest at seed stage, post seed and series A, which is however you want to define those, takes you through hopefully one, two, maybe three rounds of funding um, and hopefully sets these companies up on their route to doing even bigger and greater things um, um, further along the line. Um, we are really hoping that, um, you know, building on, on this, we'll also be able to bring in more funding into the region. We're sort of already starting to think about how we can do that and, and, and lever in additional funds and you know, already thinking about the next fund beyond this. Um, and um, I think, Jerry, it's fair to say that we've been pretty patient in, 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 as a group here. It's not been an easy journey, but delighted to, to be finally at this point and starting to, to deploy, deploy the um, investment and hoping to have a few things to announce over the next few weeks. Yeah, uh, if I can add, uh, thank you very much, Jake. Um, uh, well, we, we, we have stuff in the pipeline. Um, I, I, I don't want to preempt anything, but yeah, we are looking at... Um, closing on, on on two deals hopefully in the next um, month or so um, and and kick that off and there, there is a learning curve and it'd be fair to say we need to you know work out things but um, uh, but as it stands it's extremely positive and um, and uh, and and I'm very much hope and it was a long time uh, and, and Jake knows it as well as I do but um, uh, you know, it wasn't easy so um, it is good to get on the ground and start doing something which um, is my modus operandi fantastic yeah, absolutely terrific news um to have something tangible that people can actually um, get involved with uh, and as as we've all said it's been a long time coming um i don't know whether you read my latest investment update which just went out yesterday but um, we gave a little potted history of the different uh, investment funds in inverted commas that we have had as a region so far and um this is a real 
really is a significant milestone for us. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to, to share it with everybody today. I have one practical question and I need a, a speedy answer if I'm going to bring my event in on time. So um, the practical question, it won't surprise you to hear. I've already had people asking me and I imagine uh, some of the accountants and lawyers and investors on the call uh, today in the event will have had had people asking them, how do I access this 10 million pounds? Um, <laughs> so, who's, who's got their name on the checkbook? Or the handle <laughs> checkbook? Um, I mean, either Jake or I, I mean, as simple as that. Um, um, uh, we are sharing, mutually sharing uh, each other's pipelines. Uh, uh, Jake and I and, and others at Becker and, 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 and rest of his team are, are, are meeting every single week to go through those, those pipelines and that. So it doesn't matter where it comes in, to be frank. Um, uh, but if it's, it's very, very early stage, probably better to me. But if it's if it's something that we can um, look at quickly, then I, I either or. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you can see the other people on the on the uh, on this today, but but Sanjeev uh, Gordon, who's the ventures director at Newable, um, is also on. And and yeah, we we will be whether it comes in. I think. For Bristol-based companies, Jerry, it's obviously best to go go to to the BPEC website and apply that way. But anything that does come in um, via via us will also, you know, reach reach Jerry's desk eventually. We're going to get swamped, Jerry, but that's I suppose what we. Well, I mean, uh, um, I don't know why they're asking because I mean, I would say there's been quite a lot of um, inquiries already, so it hasn't been um, we haven't been um, short of ideas. But I mean, I mean, more the merrier. I mean, I, I think that's what we want. I mean, we want this pipeline. We want good local businesses. I mean, local being Southwest, uh, um, and, um, and and get them in um, because you know, we, we, I mean, I don't, I don't say there's any rush to do this. There's no rush to do this, uh, and we're looking very much looking forward to having um, renewables expertise and DD and all the things that um, you know, we we could sharpen up on. Um, but um, get them in. Terrific. Thank you ever so much. Um, so, yes, fantastic news. And I'm really pleased to have you both here today. And um, I'm sure we will be um, hearing from you again in, in the new year, perhaps later next year, to, to share an update on how it's all going. So uh, thank you ever so much. I